good evening, everyone. We'll make a start. Um, please be advised this meeting will be recorded and posted on the Council's YouTube channel. Can all those speaking make sure you switch on your microphone before addressing the meeting and switch off after you finish speaking? Um, I would like to welcome Councillor John Fahey to the committee as a new chair of the Children and Young People Scrutiny Panel. Um, item one, apologies for absence. I've got apologies from Councillor Maisie richards Cottell, Councillor Leah Fletcher and Councillor Izzy Cook. And Councillor Matt Hartley has given apologies for lateness. He should be here in a few minutes. Um, item number two, urgent business. I have received none. Declarations of interest, item three. Does any member have any personal or financial interest to declare on any item of the agenda? Nope. Um, minutes, item four. Are members happy to confirm as accurate the record of the minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of June? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the first substantive item, which is the Q1 savings tracker. So we're receiving an update on the council's in-year savings forecasted as at the end of Q1. Um, the, Hitesh, you're going to present this, aren't you? Yes, thank you. Um, and Nick and Kit, do you want to come to the table as well? Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, um, I'm Hitesh Chalapara. I'm the interim AD for, for, for finance. Um, the, I've just got three or four key points to make in the report. So as you know, full council agreed your budget on the 6th of March as part of the budget process. 33.7 million of savings were agreed by full council. Mm -hmm. And we have a process in place where we actually track the savings on a regular basis. And what you have here in table 5.2 is a summary position for the savings in terms of where we are, and they're categorized um, by um, any delivery issues. So for example, some may not be, may not be possible to deliver, some there might be de delivery issues, and some there might be timing issues. And the total amount of that is nine million, and there's a helpful table at the back, well I hope you find it helpful, which sets out the detail of all those savings in Appendix 1. So you see that in Appendix 1, there's a lovely bar chart as well, um, which, which explains that 24.5 million of savings are on track to be delivered. 6.5 is timing issues, and 2.3 is this delivery issues, and 0.3 just cannot be delivered following a thorough review as part of Q1. That's all I was gonna say by way of introduction. My colleagues are here to help with any questions you, you may have, particularly in relation to um, adult, adult social care. And I think there's one item in um, um, finance and legal as well. Great, thank you. Um, would, just before we move on, would you be able to clarify for us the difference between timing issue and delivery issue generally? And I know it will probably depend on the item, but it would be yeah. just good to have a bit, of, a bit more colour on exactly what that yeah. means. So um, timing could be a number of things, and again, some of it will come out in some of the digital conversation. It could be um, the fact that it can be delivered, but it might be delayed. It might be delayed by six months or by 12 months. That's a timing issue. Delivery, there might be some things that may not make it possible to deliver promptly. And it could be, um, it may be a capacity issue in some areas, and that might lead to a delivery issue. And as we go through some of those, that will, that will become apparent, apparent as well. Uh, Councillor Fahi, do you have a follow-up on that? Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for uh, your comments. I was, I was interested in the... Um, in the appendix particularly, and uh, as the chair has pointed out, there seems to be delivery issues, um, problems with regard to um, <clears throat> not possible, etc. We're currently in the third quarter of this financial year. Uh, what, is the pro what is the prospect of um, finding the nine million pounds highlighted uh, in this report? And I do think that it's quite light on information. Uh, why, for instance, aren't we being given the reasons as to why uh, these matters are not resolved um, uh, in this quarter? Um, because it seems to me that um, we ought to know if they, if they can ever be delivered. Thanks. Thank you. So um, in terms of prospects for delivery, obviously this is a, this is a position as at Q1. Um, officers are working on the position of that Q2, which will be going to cabinet 
and I think you can also look at the um, position as a Q2. Um, but in the meantime, um, offices and in the council are doing everything possible to see how else can we bridge the gap. So if these things are not, not being delivered, and, you, and, you, and you've seen the Q1 forecast or the overspend, so offices are doing everything possible to find mitigations um, elsewhere. Thank you. I think before we just move on to further questions, if I can ask um, Kit to speak to the delivery issue for your line item, and then Nick, if you can give us an overview of the issues in, um, in adult um, health and adult services, just because there's quite a large uh, number there. So it'd be good to have that overview before we go into more detailed questions. Thank you, Chair. So for the digital budget uh, savings that you'll see under delivery issues, um, we've declared that we're going to make around half of that with the rest as a delivery issue. If I just break that down for the committee, um, there are three main reasons for the slippage in these, um, and the biggest of which is the national delay in the digital switch. That digital switch will allow us to do two things. Firstly, decommission a huge number of phone lines. Um, and second, take some costs out of some of the services that are reliant on those phone lines, such as telecare and sheltered housing. So that's obviously entirely beyond our control, and that, um, the delay to that um, has led to some costs for us. Um, we think that's about a quarter of a million pounds of costs um, in this year that we'd plan to make, that uh, plan to save that we won't be able to save because of that delay that's a, a national policy decision. Um, two other internal factors, um, the reimagining of the Woolwich Centre, which um, I assume that members will be aware of, um, has been uh, delayed versus what we thought. The impact on the digital team of that is the um, equipment that we buy, um, we had projected to spend less on that because we reduced the number of workstations in the building by a third. So the delay to that, we estimate at being around a £90,000 delay um, to us, so that's a knock-on effect of a dependent programme. And then finally, um, we had a £60,000 saving attributed to the reduction in demand of mobile phones. That was on the basis that we've given out quite a large number of mobile phones um, over the last four years that we've been working in a hybrid way. Um, unfortunately, a huge number of those phones, um, Apple have taken out support and we've had to rebuy three models of iPhone that we thought we were only going to have to buy one model of, and that is a £60,000 impact. On that basis, we declared that we need to be able to make half of the savings in year. So I think, uh, sorry, just before we hand over to Nick, it might actually make sense to, for you to take your questions first. Um, those all come down to delivery issues, but if we look at, so like 60,000 on mobile phones, that's probably just gonna be not a saving thing, because it's not really a delivery issue. It's, it would make more sense to be in that red slice. Would that not be the case? Yeah, that's a good question, Chair. This one is quite a difficult judgment to make in terms of how much you declare because so much of our mobile phone demand is behaviourally led. So if I just mention two mitigations which make me think that we may be able to make this saving, and the first one is the introduction, it was only an hour ago, I didn't mean it to be quite so live, of a bring your own device policy that was approved by General Purposes Committee um, at five o'clock or so. Um, what that will allow us to do is consolidate the number of mobile phones that we give out to um, members of staff. Um, and the other thing we've been able to do is reduce our new mobile phone contract. So basically it's cheaper to buy data for mobile phones and we think we can make a mitigation that way. So it is, it's always a judgment and it's as Hitesh says, we throw so much effort at these and sometimes it's just not a mathematical judgment over how much we can make. We just throw ourselves at the problem as hard as we can. So I put this as delivery issue and I suppose it will come out in quarter two, but we'll just, we'll declare our latest position um, as we go through the year. Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair, and apologies for being a few minutes late. Um, thank you for the report. I've got a general question about the timing issue category, if, if I may, Chair. Um, I'm kind of struck that this is end of Q1, and there have been timing issues across such a vast range of different savings programmes. Um, could I ask, I, I, am I right in thinking that the PERDA period for the various by-elections that, that have taken place in the borough, and indeed the general election um, taking place in July, is a factor in some of these timing issues. That's what I've heard. Could, could perhaps Hitesh could just confirm that? I, I, I don't have the specific reasons for each timing issue. So is, 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 is it better for the relevant officer to um, comment on that? But um, 
uh, well, you see delays due to timing. So if I were to look at um, uh, Appendix 2, for example, you see that, for example, there's one saving on the top, top of page 22 as an example. It talks about lease arrangements for cafes. Agreed savings 50,000 or 25,000 won't get delivered. So it's not totally non-delivery, it's partial non-delivery and slippage for a whole host of reasons. Okay, thank you. So to, to take, take an example, Chair, the children's centres uh, changes. That consultation came out later than members were originally uh, told. And I think at the time, the reason given was the PERDA period for the by-election. Of course, we had one by-election and the general election in Q1, and then we've had two subsequent by-elections, and there may be others. So I wonder whether, to take that example, it, it, I, I just wonder whether we need to get a view on the interpretation being given to the PERDA rules, because it feels to me that there is a very strong interpretation being deployed by the council to what can and can't be done during these pretty small PERDA periods for you know, small local by-elections. And, and I think if, if, when you interrogate the reasons for the timing slippages, I suspect you'll find that PERDA is going to be cited by offices in each directorate. Um, so I wonder whether we might ask you to take that away, because it feels like, I don't see, for example, Chair, why there was any reason why the Children's Centre programme of work couldn't have continued. Um, and I just wonder whether there's a systemic thing here about the way the Council is interpreting the PERDA rules. It's not very form well formed as a question, but more of a suggestion, Chair, if I may. Would you like to respond to that point? Yes, thank you. So uh, I think you're correct. I think we'll take that away and speak to, particularly in the example you cited, we'll speak to the lead officer, um, Nasir, for that if we can log about, and we'll get back to you on that one. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Fahey. Uh, sorry, Chair. Um, I, I wanted to... Um, uh, ask a question with regard to the um, um, the asset review and the disposal of the Woolwich Centre. Uh, do I take it that uh, effectively we've now agreed that um, hybrid working uh, is here to stay uh, and so therefore uh, it's reasonable to um, look to optimise the use of the centre. In terms of that, what work has been undertaken uh, to uh, look at uh, productivity of staff uh, in this uh, hybrid working arrangement? And do we think it's a good thing? I have a feeling that might go beyond the scope of this item, but to the extent that you can answer, we'd appreciate an answer. Yeah, I think it would be inappropriate for me to comment on the full extent of your question, because some of it is about property and we haven't got already for... Um, uh, facilities here. Um, I would say, I think we all know this, the, the future of work policies are baked into our people policies. That is declared policy of the council that we do work in hybrid ways. So yeah, um, that, is, uh, that is the case. Um, and on the productivity side, uh, we've had this conversation before, councillor, from the digital point of view. And as you know, from our point of view, we have equipped staff to work in hybrid ways, which is fully in line with the council's policy and agreed. Um, I would say that the ways of managing productivity, and this is my personal view that you're aware of, um, shouldn't be measured in technical or mechanistic ways, but be, we should be measured by the output, regardless of where we work and through what means. Um, beyond that, it's probably not appropriate to comment. Do you want to come in, Nick? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I just wanted to come in, I suppose, from a service perspective as well, without commenting on, as, as, as rightly said, on the, uh, the property side of things, because we're not in a position to do that. But certainly from my perspective, um, the key for, for, my, for me is that my staff are out in the community delivering services face-to-face -to, -face to residents, and that's where our focus has been. Um, and those hybrid ways of working really support that. So I just wanted to overlay that um, within the constraints that we've got today. Uh, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. I think this is more of a comment um, than a question, but when I look at the um, appendix, it didn't actually give me enough information. You've got timing um, issue, timing delay, uh, delivery issue. What would have been really helpful is um, in terms of what had we expected the time to be and what's the new, you know, what, what's the projected new 
revised um, time. You mentioned the 350 or 250 um, that has been, you know, it's fallen out of sync. But what I didn't hear is um, when will that be delivered? Because I think if we had that information as well, if we look at the 24 million that has been delivered, what we don't have is the projected delivery, actual delivery, and then we could have draw a conclusion on these um, delayed deliveries as well. Because the information is not complete for us to have a better understanding of what the delivery, what's the um, reason for the timing. Councillor Hartley asked about the pre-election period. If we had a like a schedule of when it was expected, when it happened, that would help us to understand better uh, some of the reasons for delivery. So maybe that's a, for improvement of the tracker, that could be um, something that to take on board. Um, but just, just to confirm, the 250, when will that be delivered? Well, the digital switch has been delayed to 2026. So um, that's not my final answer, but um, if I put it this way, we are always throwing ourselves at trying to make financial efficiencies. So where we've had to declare that we can't make certain efficiencies, we'll still try and backfill with other ideas. So that's just a general comment. Um, we don't just strike one idea off and then let it go. So that particular initiative um, is 2026. So this, there are some of these savings where we will not make them but as I was saying to the chair we will try and find other ways of making efficiencies so for example we've now done a full telephony um, audit um, and we've mitigated a part of that by just decommissioning underused lines so there are ways that we can soften some of the blows here um, can I just can I just give one comment on your previous question is that okay on the, does it, the kind of granularity of the data I think what you ask is really reasonable I'd say on behalf of officers um, it is overwhelmingly complex to give you that baseline, but I don't think you're unreasonable to ask for it. In terms of the bits that I'm responsible for, um, I, I can offer that granularity. Um, I think when you try and do that for, what I want to say was 118 savings ideas, um, I think we'd, try and, we'd need to find a way of streamlining, streamlining that data so that it's even useful to you. But I, but I do think you're reasonable to ask for that. Um, I, what I would say is none of us are trying to be evasive. It's just the pace of this work is, you know, really relentless. Uh, that's not an excuse, though. Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. I don't think anybody thinks any officers are trying to be evasive. Um, although uh, that answer has actually reassured me a bit less. Um, I, I completely agree uh, about granularity. I would have, I think, appreciated even just a sentence to explain um, why something is a timing issue, what the delay is. For example, I note in the, the appendix, uh, almost all of the, the um, column that says amount that will not be delivered is, is kind of a half or a third or a quarter of the full saving. And it kind of feels, you're going through this as a layman, looking out from the outside in, you can sort of see, well, that one's obviously six months delayed, this one's a third of the year delayed. And, uh, that also gives me not much reassurance because, again, that doesn't convey a lot of grip. You've said um, it, it would be hard to streamline all that information. So that my question, Chair, is surely this information exists at the centre. This is why there is the Rethinking Services Board. I thought, it's probably a question for Hitesh, is there not a central view of each project and programme and what the timing issue is, what the actuals and revised forecasts, as Councillor Williams said, is? Do, that, can you reassure me that that data does exist somewhere in the council. So again, um, that's, that point is heard loudly. Um, your, your, your point comment about a, a sentence or two would be helpful. We'll take that away and we'll make sure you get there in future. But do you have that? Do, we, we, we have. In, we, the, we, in we, the finance we, directorate, we, do you we, know we, that? We do, we do. Oh, sorry. Do, do you know that information in the finance directorate? We do have some summary information at that level, and we'll include one or two lines going forward. Councillor Mbang. Thank you. Um, thanks for um, your comments and what you've said so far. I l I'm looking at the nine million which is attributed. It's also in line with Councillor um, Williams' um, as, um, submission about um, the fact that if you get if if you know something is not possible, you will definitely be planning towards it before uh, one will say that something is not possible. Delivery issues. What were the issues? Was, was it pre-planned? 
and then the timing. I mean, what would have been the right timing? And I think that these are things that I uh, would have liked to see more detail or information about that, so that at least we'll be able to know that, yes, this was what we were timing, and then this has rather happened. The same thing with the delivery issues as well. But if we, 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 we categorize it up to nine million, and then, um, so the question is moving forward, uh, have we identified these ones, and, and, and how is it going to be resolved in the near future, will be my question, thank you. So if I just come in on, on that um, question, just from a service perspective, and just overlay a bit of detail. So I think the first thing to say is that um, uh, we are on a period by period um, reporting back into um, the finance colleagues at the centre on our progress in some detail. So hopefully that gives some reassurance about the over oversight that there is. Um, I think the, each of the lines are very complex and sometimes summarising them is a challenge, but nevertheless, I think that's why we're here today to talk through some of the, the queries that you may have on particular items. But I think this is transparent about where we are at Q1. Um, obviously, things may have changed between now and Q2, um, and um, that will come back in, in due course, as Hitesh has said. Um, but I think, you know, part of this as well is it's the the first time I've sat down, you know, with OVN and Scrutiny to talk through this delivery in this way. So I think it's something we can probably build on um, in terms of making sure you've got the information that you need. Thank you. And if we actually now turn to you, Nick, just to give us a bit of a flavour as to, because there's, what, I think, what, about one and a half million um, of delivery issues um, within your directorate. So if you can give us a bit of a flavour as to what... Yeah, of course. I mean, I think the first thing I would say is that um, I think it's important to recognize the context. So in terms of the savings um, that health and adult services put forward in terms of the, the, the level of savings, it was um, 11.8 million to be delivered in year. So what we're actually saying here is that 9.5 million of that is on track, uh, which I think is significant in terms of uh, the amount of work that has gone into actually getting us to that position. So whilst I recognize there are um, some timing and delivery issues on some of the items, and I'll talk through those. Um, that context, I think, is really important um, against the backdrop of significant demographic and inflationary pressure that we're seeing in health and adult services. The other thing I'd just point to contextually, um, if I may, is just the CQC assurance of health and adult social care, which is a new um, requirement and a new burden to some extent on us. And therefore, it's just making sure that we've got that balance in our workforce around some of the assurance work that we're doing. So we're trying to balance a number of different priorities and I just wanted to give a bit of a flavour of that before going into some of the detail. Um, in terms of the, the, the items then, in terms of um, health and adult services, the first item that features as a um, delivery issue um, relates to um, review of the disabled facilities grant adaptations. Um, so the, the, um, the key issue there is a review of the housing adaptations policy, which is something that we're undertaking in conjunction with housing colleagues. We've reviewed the policy. The idea is to make that policy more flexible and able to ensure that we are able to deploy disabled facilities grants in a more flexible way and a more timely way to meet residents' needs and therefore any benefit would come from the health and adult social care revenue budget. There have been some delivery issues just in relation to the resources around being able to review that policy, but I can reassure you that that policy um, is, is in the process of being reviewed, and once that's been reviewed, um, I'm sure that the benefit will be realised. Um, so whilst it is a delivery issue, it's, it's a timing issue as well. So I think, you know, the, the, there's, there's an element of that. It will deliver. It just needs time. And a mitigation for that is that we can actually utilise some of the Disabled Facilities Grant um, in order to mitigate that um, savings requirement in year by, um, you know, using that DFG grant um, to um, fund some of the staffing uh, pressures that we've got within our OT service. So I think that's one example um, in terms of that delivery. Do you want me to go through, because there's a number of them, I'm happy to go through them all, or I'm equally happy to go through some selective 
selected ones, uh, Chair. Happy to do whatever suits you in the panel. I was going to say the bigger ones, but to be honest, they're all of a similar value. So I think if you wouldn't mind yeah. sort of giving us five minutes on it, I think that'd be helpful to the committee. Of course, yeah. Um, so when it comes to um, the next item, which is reablement and social care, just checking that I've got the right one. Yep, reablement and social work decision making. So our reablement in-house team and our in-house service, and for those that may or may not know about reablement, it's um, a six week or up to six week um, provision um, that um, comes in to people's homes um, to support people to become more independent after perhaps a fall or an episode in hospital. That's the critical time that we can make sure we invest as much upfront as possible to make sure that people are as independent as possible after six weeks. Um, we've done a lot of work with our in-house team to test it against um, the volumes of people it can see and maximise that and also maximise its effectiveness. So we've got some really good measures in place and we've actually got a, a, a system in place of actually measuring the, the benefit of that. And the benefit of that is that we don't pay as much ongoing for home care provision for people because we've uh, enabled people to become as independent as possible. So we've got a metric against that. Um, what we're saying and seeing this year is that our ambition was 1.5 million. What we're actually seeing is that whilst we're seeing a similar number of people as we were last year, the effectiveness level is not as great as it was last year. And that is down, in our view, to the complexity of residents coming through the service um, and the higher level of acuity that we're seeing with people, particularly that are discharged from hospital. So that gives, I think, a flavor of why we're not quite hitting that target. It, it, at quarter one, it is something that we, you know, will obviously keep um, re under review. Um, but I think the important thing there as well is to note that we do make sure that we don't just offer six weeks as a, as a straight offer. Um, some people may need the six weeks, but some people need less. And actually, our average time on the service is about 21 days. So that performs quite well against some of ben our benchmarking against other authorities. Um, in terms of commissioning for improved outcomes for residents, there's effectively three elements to that. So one is around us expanding our shared lives scheme. And again, for uh, perhaps members of the panel who aren't as familiar with shared lives, we again have an in-house service. It's, it's um, effectively almost, I'd characterize it as an adult fostering type arrangement. It's someone opening their own home up to support someone often with a learning disability in a non-institutional setting. We've got a really good rated uh, provision in-house. We know we can expand that. Um, and we think we can expand that. We've engaged someone to support us to do that. That's taken us a bit longer to engage, um, Supported Living Plus, who are a, an expert in the field, and they will help us to expand that scheme. So again, th there's a delivery issue there, but it is a timing issue as well, because once we will, once we end up um, uh, in the space and, and uh, of, of expanding that scheme and be it benefiting more people, we will avoid the costs of high cost care in things like supported living, but we will also improve, and this is the, mo the most important thing, improve the outcomes for those residents who want to live normal and full lives. So that's one of the elements to that. It's not the only element to that, um, but I'll, I'll sort of give, leave that as an example. The mental health review of the Section 75 arrangements um, is again um, where within our social work practice we talk about being strength based in our practice and looking at people's uh, what people can do and what they can achieve rather, rather than a deficit model of supporting people um, with lots of care that does unto someone so that's our approach um, we've been working hard with our mental health colleagues and, and oxley's where we've got social workers seconded into oxley's um, they work within a more of a medical model, and part of this is a culture shift of their co the colleagues that work in that uh, service to work in more of a strength-based way. What I would say as well, in, so we're, we're not as far forward as we might want to be in that context, and the consequence of that is we're seeing greater budget pressures in some of the, um, the placement budgets in the mental health service. 
But what I would say is that we've had an LGA peer review of our adult social care services two weeks ago, which was really positive about our strength-based practice. Um, and it's good to get that independent sort of view on that. Um, but they also picked up and made some recommendations about how we might strengthen our approach with our mental health colleagues as well. Um, the assistive technology enabled care service, um, and this is where there's been some uh, fantastic work across the directorates, and so Kit and the digital team have been absolutely uh, key and critical to delivering this work alongside um, the director of commissioning, who sits within health and adult services, putting together uh, a package whereby we've got health and social care investment into an assistive technology enabled care service. I would, I would say this is actually, at, because we've been going through a process of, of reporting back period to period on these items, um, this is actually, I would say, a timing issue rather than a delivery issue because we've got a, um, a, a, a go live date of January. We've got a partner procured to, um, to uh, support us with the ATEC offer and we've got a culture change piece of work with our practitioners so that they can offer that technology to people and you know, manage down some of our revenue costs. So really important and uh, a really good example, I think, of not just cross-working across the, the council, but also uh, cross-working in an integrated way across health and adult social care. Um, our strength-based operating model, um, so that's about how our um, infrastructure and the support for our social workers really supports them in ways that um, uh, uh, when we were talking about um, hybrid working and Councillor Farhi referenced that, <clears throat> we want more, more of our workers out face-to-face, um, -face, less bureaucracy, less form filling. And so that's part of our move to our operating model. So <clears throat> there's a combination of um, working with our colleagues and our social workers to make sure that their practice is uh, strength-based, but also that alongside that, some of the technology and some of the pathways that we work with deliver in that way. The, deli the delivery issue there has been around some of the capacity to do that change at the same time as managing unprecedented demand at our front doors, front door of hospital, front door of um, our community services. <clears throat> and then the final item, um, which is uh, external funding opportunities, had been that <clears throat> we'd assumed on uh, some external funding opportunities that may be available in year that we could <clears throat> draw on to fund some of our change work. That, that level of opportunity in grants and funding that, that um, has been available perhaps in previous years hasn't been available so far in that first quarter. And so that's why we're flagging that as something that we're um, uh, at the moment unable to achieve. That may change um, through the course of the year and we're always looking for opportunities to do that. So hopefully um, that covers the... Uh, the main delivery items. There is a, there are some, there are three timing items as well. One is expanding our step down provision. Um, and so uh, the panel may or may not be aware, but we have um, in, we have some, uh, in, an, uh, in a previously sheltered block, got some step down from hospital provision, which we've been really innovative about creating so that it takes the pressure out of the hospital system with people who can't immediately return home. What we haven't done with that is judged um, up till now, up till this year, what that, that, what that support offers by way of financial support to the health and social care system and therefore being able to lobby for health resources and other things uh, into that space. So we're now measuring that. Um, our original assumption was a certain amount. Um, it's not quite that amount based on what we're seeing, but we've got other work across the, sec across the health and social care sector to review what's called our intermediate care provision, that step down from hospital provision, of which that's a key part. We know it's, it's really delivering good outcomes because 90% of people that go into that provision return home, uh, and we're also alleviating some pressure from the hospital. Um, the other two items, the review of the charging policy, we have actually, while well, it's partial, is that we've, um, we have reviewed and consulted on our extra care um, policy and charging policy. 
Um, that's due to come to Cabinet in December. Um, so that accounts for a proportion of that amount. Um, we are doing work um, with colleagues on reviewing our charging policy. But alongside the charging policy, the mitigation is around how we can make sure we're collecting the um, income that we need to collect and that we are um, a, a, a approaching uh, our financial assessments in a way that um, means that people get financially assessed sooner rather than later in the process. Um, so those things all contribute into that, into that space. And then finally, the review of the inflationary uplifts, which is a significant amount and which I can report now um, will, will be an improved position in Q2. Um, this is Q1, so I was taking myself back to Q1, but um, I think this is a really challenging area. Um, it's about what we pay providers in our external provider market. So there are certain providers that we pay who guarantee us London living wage for their, for their workforce and um, where we're contractually obliged at times to, um, to pay because we've secured that commitment. There are others in the market who, um, who, to whom we are you know, beholden to market forces. So last year in particular, we saw a lot of inflationary requests given the, the inflationary position last year. Um, what we've said to the market is we will, where we can maintain those levels, but we may not be in a position to increase them. So that's accounting for our, our, at the outset, our target around you know, managing uh, inflation and demography. I suppose in adult social care, our way of balancing our budget is twofold. It's managing demand and managing inflation, essentially, and using the various levers that we've got to do that, but always putting our statutory uh, position in, in, at the forefront and thinking about uh, the outcomes we deliver for residents. I hope that's helpful. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thanks. So I think that was really, really helpful. I think the one thing that really, really struck me when you were going through that is, again, these definitions of delay versus like sort of timing issue versus delivery issue because actually the three you've just described on the timing issue actually seem to me more that they might not be delivered because having gone through those three things and similarly pretty much everyone you said on the so I and then so what, what I'm saying is when we went through this and decided who to invite one of the reasons that we invited you is you had so many in the delivery column and I thought in terms of rather than having every director here every time we go through a dashboard like which ones seem the most interesting. And here, because it was delivery rather than timing issues, that's why you've been lucky enough to be invited, Nick. But actually, when you then look through the timing issue, it also, it might be almost definitional, department by department, because, so children's services have pretty much put all of theirs in timing. Um, same with housing and safer communities, and communities environmental and central. So I just wonder the benefit of the two, the distinction, and if there is a benefit, I'm not sure you're getting that benefit, so I'm not sure everyone's defining it in the same way. So I guess that's a comment for you, Hitesh, to take away um, for the future dashboards. And Sorry, Nick, did you want to come in on something there? Just very briefly to say that I think um, that some of, that we have got more refined about our um, reporting as well um, into the central reporting over the months that we've been doing that period by period. So I think that that will change, you know, the, the, and be clearer about what's the timing of the delivery issue going forward. That said, I do think there's complexity in some of the, the, some of the categories I've talked about. So because they're, uh, they're, they're areas where there might be elements of both, which way do you, you know, which way do you, you, you categorize it? For me, with all of these health and adults uh, pieces, by and large, I'm confident that they are things that we will deliver, you know, in the course of um, uh, the, the two-year period, you know, if not the, 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 the year in question, where I've talked about the amount of delivery that we've got going on. Um, but it's helpful to have the opportunity to talk through those so that we can refine that reporting going forward. Uh, Councillor Williams. Thank you. I think you've said exactly what I was going to say, because it's a bit blurred. And I did wonder if the fi finance team, I don't know if you're the one that sets the category. Um, this is where the narrative would be very important for the report because the delivery and timing, when it's a mixture of delivery and timing, you know, if we knew that, it, you know, it would um, 
add a bit more context to it. I'm wondering if that, if the report could be uh, refined, um, maybe whether another category or maybe uh, some uh, comments, because if you had another category where it's a mixture and then you explain, that'll um, reduce or that will define what's delivery and separate timing. I think that uh, will enhance the report. I've got a question for Nick. It's more like clarification. I think when you mentioned the, when you spoke about the operation model um, project, to me it sounded like the Newton project, and I just want to make sure that we're not talking about the, it's, it's not the same thing. Thanks. No, the, the straight answer to that is no, it's not the same thing. Um, in terms of the, just just to clarify, for the, in terms of the operating model, I suppose there's, there's two elements to it. One is our social work practice, and that's led by a principal social worker to make sure the, the, the um, workforce is working in a strength-based way. The other elements relate to some of the work that we're doing with colleagues like Kit and Digital about redesigning the way our teams are configured so that they're the best fit for our residents. So, uh, yeah, but Newton aren't involved in that work. Councillor Hartley. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Nick. I've got a, two, a comment and two questions, really. Um, I, I suppose that um, we guess we shouldn't be surprised that it's mostly, like a lot of these are from health and adults because there's a lot of scale and a lot of complexity in the savings that you're making. But that does give us an opportunity maybe for you to help us understand the process, just zooming out. So you as the Director of Health and Adults, how are you being held to account from your perspective for the delivery of these savings that are in the, uh, these two categories? Yes, yeah, so um, in terms of the accountability, that certainly comes through that monthly um, report on the savings. I mean, there's obviously accountability and monitoring of the budget overall, of which this is a particular slice, but in terms of the uh, what I've described, there's a monthly rhythm of us having to report on those and then justify what the reasons are, and and also to to, to talk through what the mitigations are, and, and ultimately I've got responsibility for delivering a balanced budget to the authority, so that is my accountability and responsibility. So um, this, is, this is one element, alongside this element, we've obviously got the, the overall budget monitor and, and how we're held to account for that, as well as looking at mitigation measures throughout as well. So you obviously feel like you are being held to account, which is good to hear. Um, do you have, as a director, do you have the support you need from the centre to, not just to deliver the savings, but to catch up on the savings that are at risk? Yeah, so we, so we absolutely have the support there. I think some of the, and, and we have the support from Finance colleagues, I've talked about some of the support that we get from Kit and the digital team in terms of some of the change, um, the, the change capacity that's needed um, to, to overlay on, on top. And there was provision made, uh, as you'll know, you know, for change capacity to deliver these um, these these uh, these savings. So I think there's, but there, of course, as you'd imagine getting some sometimes recruiting specialist roles to support with some of that can you know come with a delay for example so um that 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 um support is most definitely there um some of the challenges you know aren't just about that councillor fahi uh thank you chair and uh, thank you so much for the uh, presentations and the the comments you made i think um I had the opportunity of getting more clarification from our discussions than I had from the paper. And I think one of the important issues, I think, for me uh, is the importance of having more detailed information. Because as a scrutiny uh, uh, panel, our role is to investigate not only the issues relating to the uh, budget uh, difficulties we have, but the impact that that has on the community. Uh, and so therefore it seems to me that there are some very large savings to be required here. And I think we, it would be useful for us in the longer term to have a view as to the impact on our community, uh, together with the numbers uh, involved. And I think we're, Chair, we're playing catch up really, I think, in getting uh, quarter one now. And when are we gonna get quarter two? 
uh, which, which is something I think that you may want to follow up at some point um, in, in, in the future. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Just to come in there as well, part of the reason we're getting it so late is because it has been pushed back due to things like pre-election periods. Um, and I think we're due to see uh, quarter three and quarter four. So um, we'll be doing the full next budget in the January meeting. And I think the November meeting, the Q2 will not be ready yet. So it's also about timing these meetings with the, the dashboards. Absolutely, Chair. But I mean, uh, on the point raised earlier, that seems to me in terms of the PARDA element, which is not our remit, uh, but it just seems to me if we have a cabinet meeting uh, and other meetings of the council, uh, then there's no reason why we can't have scrutiny meetings. Noted, thank you. Councillor Mbang. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> and thanks, uh, Nick, for the detailed information about these areas. They are areas of importance for, for some of us, um, personally, I will say. Um, I believe that when it comes to health and social care, it is very important to just remember that um, you, can, you can try to reduce costs or you can try to effectively um, deliver, but we should, not be, uh, we should be thinking about the, the health of the individual or the, the, the social well-being of the individual, which is more important than another thing. But I think you've listed a lot of areas that are really very, very important, um, especially the re-enablement re and that of the step-downs. You might not have the immediate kind of, um, 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 you know, effective reduction of costs, but in the long run, it will go a long way to, to, um, to, to help in reducing cost. And I think that reducing complexity as well is very important. I've always mentioned this to emphasize on the public side of things, um, preventive measures to, to stop complexities before it reaches a particular stage. That really is costing a lot with the hospitals and that of the social care. And I want to just say that um, I know while people might be learning from you, are we learning from other local authorities in the form of Benmark um, to, to making sure that delivery issues are, are reduced and the timing is right? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think um, one of the things that we've done, and it, because of, I suppose, that we're, we're clearly reporting back here importantly on delivery of savings, um, which is why we're here. The overall context for the work that we're doing is that the, each of those areas that we've identified, um, we've done very carefully, and it's been part of our view of how we can deliver against the R Greenwich Mission One uh, and, and others, but also how we can deliver against our Health and Adults Vision, which is all about being strength-based and, and being preventative in our approach. And we've got more to do in that space, undoubtedly, and some of the the work um, that we've done with Kit and her team, for example, um, around the p potential preventative benefits of something like assistive technology, is is pushing in that in that pushing us, us into that direction. So your point around prevention, I think, is really well made. And then in terms of benchmarking, yes, we we do seek to learn from from others. We've got various benchmarking of costs, unit costs. But also, we do a lot of networking with colleagues who are working in the field to understand what's new and what's emerging. Um, and, and so we, we do that learning. Um, but I, I also think we need to be proud of what we're delivering here in Greenwich. And, and actually, uh, I re referenced the peer review, which will report in time. But they actually commented that, that, that some of our delivery we don't um, make as much of as we should do in terms of you know our delivery in health and adult social care and, and some of the profile of that so that has kind of been brought forward by the cqc process but i'm i'm airing away from savings into other territory but i i, I think your points are really well made it was on the peer review but nick has covered it at the, towards the end just one last bit on the peer review um did you think, do you think from the report that they've issued, we'd need to revise the savings figure, revise down? Do we have to invest just for you to be realistic? Yeah, I, th I, th I think it's important that the peer, to note the peer review and also CQC explicitly say they will not look at the financial context of the, the authority or the directorate. So that's a really interesting thing, but it's actually 
something that means that they're just focused on you know what we what we're delivering and the the message back was they can see how much we're delivering some of what they said to us was we need to do perhaps a better job of describing that so you know those were some of the headlines without um without um spoil trailer spoiling the uh, the report coming out um, Hitesh, do you look like you want to come in there? Was there anything else you wanted to add based on the last few comments? I think all, all, all the comments have been, been helpful. Um, as you know, uh, in terms of revising savings down, we have got a grid budget that's based on delivery of 33 million. And you, you've noticed, you may have noticed from the sort of Q2, um, Q1 report you've seen, you know, we have got an ongoing challenge in terms of the um, level of um, savings efficiencies the council is defined as well so you know if, if one were to go down we've got to find it from somewhere else sadly that's the environment in, you know the environment we're in at the moment thank you um it looks like nobody has any more questions um so just to to sum up a couple of points that the the panel have made i think when we next see the tracker it'd be really helpful to have that little bit extra granularity a sentence against each item to have a bit more color and to revisit the, the definitions, I think, of timing issue versus delivery issue and whether or not that's helpful to you um, centrally, Hitesh, and if it, that can be better brought out because here it did feel like the lines were very, very blurred. Um, and then also you were going to take away um, the question about pre-election periods and the extent to which those are causing delivery issues and if, there's, if we are maybe being too conservative there. Um, well, thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Great. We are now moving on to item six. Um, and David White is going to be um, presenting the Equality and Equity Action Plan annual update. Uh, and Rhiannon. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, just apologies from Councillor Cousins. Um, she's had some di uh, diary conflicts at the MERD sort of late um, this afternoon, so has been delayed and unfortunately not able to um, attend the meeting this, this evening. Um, the report provides an update on the previous equity objectives um, that ran to 2024, um, as well as on the setting of the new objectives, uh, which is due to be considered by the Council's Cabinet on the 24th of November. Uh, the setting of equality objectives is a uh, legal requirement for public sector authorities such as, as the Council. Um, with the approach to setting objectives um, has been changed for the 2024 to 2028 objectives uh, to move it closer to the our Greenwich missions uh, and in particular the setting of uh, measurable, up measurable outcomes for um, each of the equality objectives um, as well as the use of, da of um, data from the internal EDI dashboard and the 2021 census to help us better understand our workforce and how that reflects our residents. Uh, and then finally, in terms of the approach that we've taken to the objectives, um, that we've sought to sort of bridge the gap a bit more between the council and the residents, and residents in terms of how those are set, uh, with several objectives focusing on how we put residents at the heart of um, services. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or should I kick off? Um, so I think it's a really, really interesting report and it's good to see sort of what you've done and what you're planning to do. Um, and I'm really pleased to see intersectionality um, be a big part of sort of what we're moving into. One thing that really seemed missing to me is that there's no mention of social mobility as one of the equality characteristics. And I wondered if this was something you'd looked at and discounted or if it's something that you might consider sort of weaving into the, the outcomes going forwards. Um, certainly it's something that we can, we can look at weaving, weaving in in terms of the action plan. Um, because social mobility is not explicitly one of the equality objectives or the additional one relating to care adopted by the council, it's not sort of been at the forefront of that consideration. However, I think there is that tie through in terms of how we ensure greater social mobility um, to linking to ensuring that greater diversity, particularly in senior roles at the organisation where there are disproportionately, uh, or where we are disproportionately less diverse than, than in other roles. 
I think that's right, and social mobility plays such a huge part in intersectionality as well, so I wonder if there's something that could be looked at there. Um, the other thing that struck me is it relates to um, objective two and looking at the recruitment of senior management to make sure it's more representative of our residents. And my personal view is that should probably be extended past senior management because when you're looking to fill senior manager roles, if you're, if you're promoting internally but the layer below is not very diverse, then you're not promote, able to promote internal talent. So I wondered if there was a reason that you were just focusing on at senior management. And again, is it something that we should be looking at sort of the level below in order to ensure sort of diverse succession planning? Um, I think we do need to consider the level below. However, off the top of my head, um, and I, I apologies, I don't have the figures to hand for this. I believe it's the, the particular issues with diversity in terms of a quartile basis within the organisation are the, the top quartile and the, the lowest quartile of, of staff, um, with the, the two quartiles in the middle um, in terms of seniority being more representative of the borough as a whole. So I think the particular challenge is how we sort of translate that, that divert, the diversity, particularly around race, ne race and ethnicity in the the second quartile into um, the quartile above it uh, in terms of seniority. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hartley? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for the, uh, uh, introducing the report. Um, I've got a question about age, which is the, the point I've raised quite a few times. There's lots of good stuff in here about lots of the protected characteristics, but barely anything about older people, and that's an absolutely central part of the Equality Act. Um, so just to illustrate the point, um, the word ethnicity, you know, ethnicity appears uh, 20 times in the document. Um, LGBT occurs dozens of times. Older people occurs once. And it says we need to ensure services are accessible to older people and potentially consider staff who work, continue to work over the age of 65, which is right. But there's no action in there that's dedicated to older people. So I guess my question is, you know, do we think... Do you think that, that there could be more of a focus on older people? Um, or is there, and it's just not in the report? Um, so part of the age thing is that when we did our comparison, we found actually at least um, where we have our most um, impact is obviously within our own staff is that we disproportionately have quite an older staff. Actually, we have almost, I think, uh, statistics about 40% getting on for quite a lot over the age of 55. So we have a very, 50, sorry, it's a statistics are in there, I can't remember off my head, but we have a very, we have a, an aging workforce compared to, especially compared to the borough as a whole, which is quite a young borough. So we're not at all dismissing, you know, the issues around like the older people face, but especially where we, where we have the greatest leaders and um, we actually do quite well in that. And actually we do have, um, pretty much across the board, we have a lot of, um, and it's, it's in the, the, the information provided, but we do have an aging workforce. So um, we're obviously happy to look at older people, but there's obviously crossovers with a lot of things like social care and other, how we make service accessibility. And, and obviously a lot of that will get touched upon when we um, cover things like disability because of, you know, so there's a lot of like crossover, I would say, that with the issues that older people face, if you're looking at it in a broader sense, in not just in terms of recruitment, but accessibility, so services, et cetera. So I think, you know, that's part of it. But in terms of, say, recruitment and our staffing, we, we actually got quite an aging and older staff, which is great for the experience, but just compared to other places and in, in terms of the objectives themselves I think the only the only sort of specific um pretty characteristic that we pick out on on the objectives themselves is around um uh, disability um and so the the sort of part of the intention around those objectives is to ensure that we aren't disregarding um, particular protected characteristics when for example considering uh, the design of our services Okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks for the explanation. I'm, I just, I'm conscious that, I mean, I, I'm, I think my concern isn't necessarily about representativeness, but about how older people, because the workforce is ageing, um, are able to access services even internally as employees. And I, I would take a bit of comfort from seeing age as the protected characteristic of being a bit more prominent in future updates. Um, so that's, that's the comment I would make. So less about representativeness and more about 
the experience of being older and, and an employee at the council, I think it's important that we give that a, a focus, just as a, perhaps as a, as a suggestion, Chair. And, and certainly arising from this piece of work, so assume, assuming the objectives agreed by Cabinet on the 24th of November, the next stage will be the development of an action plan that then goes into a bit more granularity. So I think there's scope there to pick up um, some work around age there. Councillor Williams. Thank you very much. I think it's, um, I was quite impressed to see the detail in this report, some things I didn't really consider. Um, so it's good to see that our direction of travel is, is going in the right place. I, you just mentioned the action plan. I wasn't quite sure um, on the action plan, maybe it's because I was just looking at the flow chart, how we will capture any emerging issues um, that needs to be embedded into the EDI strategy, for example, neurodiversity and, and other things that will arise in that four-year period. Um, so I wasn't sure how that will be captured in the um, task and finish group, maybe. Yeah, um, so the, the way that we've done this, this is why we've not deliberately set actions out. We've set benchmarks. So the action plan will come up with some initial actions, but as things change and shift, throughout the, um, you know, throughout the four-year period as they do, it gives us a scope to rethink about the actions. So the objectives, and again, we've deliberately kept them broad so that we can kind of capture a lot more, you know, uh, characteristics across the board. But it is a flexible and moving document, so the way that we will, you know, review it every year to see what changes are happening. And, you know, we, the, the, the most thing we're concerned about is, you know, meeting... Um, the measures that we've set out and that we're going to sort of flesh out in the action plan but it's it's deliberately set out so that we can meet new challenges and i guess just following on from that so to be clear although your action the actions can change over the four-year period would there also be scope for the benchmarks to change as and when new information might come to light yeah, absolutely. So we're setting up some benchmarkings because we didn't do it before, but if we get more information, more, we would definitely consider how we can incorporate that so we're keeping everything up to date as, you know, but through proper process and agreement. And part of the intention as well with setting the benchmarks or having um, outcome-based measures in here is so that when we bring, this, bring the annual update back to overview and scrutiny, there is that opportunity to interrogate the, the progress against the objectives with a bit more data. So if it's something where we're seeing ourselves hitting those, uh, those outcomes quite easily to look at how we can test ourselves a bit more. Alternatively, if we're, we're not seeing the progress we'd like to, to look at how we can, we can improve. Councillor Fahey. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, I, I, I found the report uh, extremely interesting and uh, obviously reflects the opportunity for us to look at our diverse community and see whether we're doing the right things and making progress uh, uh, in, in that regard. Um, I think I've got a few questions, really. Um, why four years? Um, and how do we measure success in reality? And um, community engagement I find very interesting because um, I get most of my information from the council on social media, which is great, uh, but um, it doesn't help those who don't have access to social media. Um, and I looked recently at uh, some of the consultation, uh, some of the consultations that have taken place, um, and in some cases, about five to six percent. And Councillor Hartley mentioned uh, older people. Uh, access to social media, uh, both from an economic and um, informative point of view for all the people, is a serious challenge. And um, I'm not quite sure we're doing a lot about that. Um, but we, t we, we tend to presume uh, that we know best. And anybody coming to a meeting like this might think, well, my goodness me, what are they doing here? And what are they talking about? So are we actively engaged across the borough? We are in some cases because uh, there are pockets of activity in communities that know how to operate the system, know how to work well. But there are very large groups of people that have no understanding how the council works or how uh, they can become engaged in the community process. And I'm just wondering really whether 
we're more concerned about printing a very glossy document uh, rather than actually looking seriously as to what we mean about meaningful engagement and do you think we're doing the right thing in uh, having this document which we think to ourselves, well, that's fine now we've got a document, we can file it away and uh, look at it every year. I, 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 probably get a, I probably feel a bit pessimistic. Um, so just taking those, those sort of three questions in, in turn, so uh, why four years? Um, the, uh, the particular legislation that um, in, requires uh, public sector authorities to, um, to set equality objectives, which is the Equality Act 2010 Specific Duties Regulations 2011, um, specifies a period of up to four years. So it's, it's the period allowed in, in the regulations that require us to, to set objectives. Um, so we, we wouldn't be able to have, say, a longer period. And going for a shorter period potentially allows us to set less ambitious objectives and less time to achieve them than going for a slightly longer period that allows us to, to work uh, for longer on, on the delivery of those. Um, in terms of how we measure success, um, I think it is a, 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 a difficult one in terms of how exactly we, we do that. There, um, there is, as uh, referenced in the report, there is quite a bit of an engage, engagement going on. The idea behind the use of data, data ultimately for this type of measure is, is not the be all and end all. Um, lived experience is, is very important. Um, but it is a way of just giving us that, that more objective way of being able to, to state um, the progress that we made and where there are particular areas of weakness. And this doesn't preclude engagement that the council is, carries out internally. So for example, through the um, EDI steering group with um, staff and networks that represent um, marginalized communities within the council. Uh, and then finally on the community engagement point, um, I wouldn't, community engagement is that the council has re, um, earlier this year, um, I think launched a new community engagement framework under um, Jeanette Brooks in the community engagement team um, and part of the focus there um, has, and part of the work that we've done with, with um, Jeanette around that has been around how we make sure that we're building in approaches that facilitate better engagement with um, marginalised uh, and minoritised communities within the borough because it is something where we want, if we're, we're engaging with communities we need to make sure that's meaningful and, and is accessible to all rather than just the same old people who we would always normally consult. Councillor Mbang. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for your report and your detailed um, information on paper. Um, when it comes to equality, I always want to, um, I, don't, uh, I look at the practicality of equality. So um, the framework definitely, um, if you were to say um, for the past like two, three years, the direction in which we are moving, are we making any impact at all? Are we making any progress at all? I would like to know when it comes to recruitment and senior management, um, what is actually being done to support minority groups to be able to get into positions of senior management? Um, then the last question I would like to also find out is um, there are a group of people who definitely will be needing our support like uh, persons with disability, old age people, people who are not able to read or write and therefore need some advocacy and wonder how do we move these people and give them the needed support to equally um, um, be, be part of um, the agenda or the framework that we have. Um, if you can just touch on those, thank you. Um, so in terms of progress, we have been making progress in, in our recruitment. Um, it is, we do have statistics within the document which does outline where we are and where we have been. And again, this is sort of why we wanted to get um, baseline data because that's something that we've really struggled to really articulate the actual progress that we've been making. Um, in terms of a lot of future work with disabilities and, you know, people who, you know, um, who English isn't their first language, struggles to communicate, you know, reading, writing, etc. You know, obviously it's why we've, we've highlighted disability in, as one of our objectives, but um, the action plan will um, highlight a lot further, a lot more of the work that we're looking to undertake to support them. But we obviously have a lot of, um, obviously work across the council to support 
um, as well as our voluntary sector um, groups who, who also provide that kind of support um, as well. So there's a lot of mechanisms that we're going to look at and the development of the action plan will enable us to be more, um, consider the wider picture and um, pr put forward actions that will address some of those concerns about specific groups. So it's a bit broad right now, but we want to get our information correct and actually um, actions that might work for people basically rather than putting something forward that doesn't necessarily like address the actual core concerns. So. Um, one other sort of point that I had is on page 62 of your, sorry, on page, where is that? The, I've got the top outcome on page 72, but I think the, cha the pages have changed. Um, the percentage of senior management who have undertaken equalities training is one of the objectives that you're hoping to benchmark. And I think you should consider expanding it beyond senior management again, because you have mentioned earlier in the port that one of the challenges you've had is engaging sort of middle management in a sort of EDI training. Uh, if I may, which page? 60? Page 60 of yours, which is 71 of the pack. Um, and it's the top outcome on that page. So it's 60 of your report. It has um, percentage of senior management who have undertaken equalities training to be sort of benchmarked. Um, and I was just wondering if you should consider expanding that or having two measures for sort of, again, the level below, because you did call out earlier in the report the challenges you've had engaging sort of middle, middle management with equalities training. Uh, yeah, we can we can certainly uh, have look at having that, uh, an additional measure in there. It's it's something where I think my preference would be for a a second measure. So looking so having one measure that focuses on uh, senior management and then one that focuses on on middle management, just so that it then ties in uh, ties into the that first objective around uh, leadership management councillors acting as one. Okay, um, so. Do members have any recommendations they would like to submit to Cabinet? Because this report is going to Cabinet. I think um, the f one that I would like to see is some consideration of intersectionality and age um, within the action plan that you develop. I don't think it needs to be pulled out specifically in this report, but I think it should be sort of mentioned at the Cabinet meeting and taken forward in the action plan. Councillor Hartley? And I'd support adding social mobility to your point earlier, Chair, if that was something we wanted to add to that recommendation. I did mean social mobility when I said intersectionality. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and yes, the other one, if you could look at adding the outcome for middle management as well, I think that would be really helpful at addressing some of the challenges that you found this year. Has anyone else got any recommendations they would like to add? Great. Um, and I'd also like to ask if we can schedule uh, your action plan to come back to scrutiny as well. Um, just as this has come before the report to Cabinet, I think it'd be really helpful if you brought it in for pre-decision scrutiny um, again, and we'll work to try and schedule that in. Councillor Fahey. Thank you, Chair. That's very helpful. Uh, I was just wondering whether we could add something around how in real terms we can accelerate and improve community engagement across the borough. Uh, we have this in writing, we have this in the report, uh, but it seems to me we need to have some information about how in reality is going to happen. So I'm not sure if that would be covered within the context of this report, although they do consult. I think broader consultation is something that would perhaps fall into Councillor Williams panel. Approach a, approach a community consultation. As part of the community engagement strategy overall. Yes, yeah, part. So there's an there's a separate strategy. Um, but if Councillor Williams picks that up as part of the item that comes to her panel, I think that would be the most sensible place. I, I agree with um, John that um, um, these things need to be communicated to the commun uh, various communities because very fantastic um, work frame. But then, do our residents know that this is what we are working? Wait. Um, so I think whichever way we can put that across for them to, to more or less understand it will be very, very helpful, yes. 
Um, and just to add, if you go back to the recommendation that Councillor Hartley and I suggested about social mobility and age, I think that should include both older people and younger people because also what struck me is the demographics of our ageing workforce when reading the report. So let's make sure it, it covers age in its entirety. Um, thank you. Are you happy with that as well? One, let, let's have every age. <laughs> um, thank you both very much for your time and for the report. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the forward plan. Um, is everybody, has anyone got anything they want to say on the forward plan or anything they want to bring to attention? Nope. Um, commissioning future report. So on the 28th of November, um, we'll be having the carbon neutral plan update. Um, is there anything in particular that members would like to see in that update? Um, you can also feel free to email, have a think about it and email uh, me and Nazir in the next few days. Just one, Hartley. one suggestion, Chair. We had an excellent session, didn't we, a year ago on this, and I think what they brought was more than enough for us to engage with it. But maybe we could add to that a specific update on the, I think, 12 recommendations that went to Cabinet, just to save us digging through it. It would be really helpful for them to give a progress update. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. And that concludes the meeting, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.